Blessings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. It's so good to be with you today. And by the way, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In fact, it doesn't matter what's going on in our world, right? Because he is still on the throne. And we have victory in him. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. So I just encourage you, wherever you're at right now, let's just shout out. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. You might have heard some extra voices in the sanctuary with me. I'm so excited today because Mike and Linda have joined us from Maui. They decided to come home. They're safe, they're good, and they're here with us today. And then we have Cliff and Stan as well. You may not see them just because of the camera, but they are here leading our worship and being a part of us today. I look forward to the time that we will get together again. And I will let you know, obviously it's not this Sunday, it may be next Sunday, but I will, I'll put out an announcement, I'll be in contact with you so that you know. But I celebrate the time that we get to be together again. Well, with that, let's prepare our hearts and just turn our hearts. I know there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stress in our lives, a lot of anxiety because of what's going on. You may be watching the news a lot, and I encourage you just not to. Because you know what? The truth is, is that Jesus is on the throne. This is not the end of the world. But rather, this time is an invitation for us to draw closer to him, to draw into his presence, to allow him to be our God. And, and so I encourage you that although we may be getting closer to things kind of resembling normal, let's not go back to normal where our lives are so busy and we're just trying to fit God in, but instead, let's allow him to be the center of us, the center of our lives. So take these next days as we kind of get ready to resume normal and rest in him. He is our king. He's your king. And he, he's our provider, and he is, he's all that we need. And so as we bring our hearts to him today, and we lay down the burdens that we have on our heart, let's just turn our hearts to him. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Amen. amen. So with that, let's just, I, I love this song, I love you, Lord. Let's just open our hearts, open just sing out to him, just in adoration of who he is. Hmm. Jesus, we love you. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King. In what you hear, and may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Jesus, we just come to you. We just turn our hearts, our minds, and our souls to you. I thank you that your word says that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And so today, we're just hungry to be in your presence more and more and more. And so thank you for the promise that you're drawing near to us. Give us a greater hunger and a greater thirst to seek you out with a fervency, with a desperation, knowing that you are King of Kings, and without you, we have nothing. And so today, as we lift our voices, and it's a little awkward God, may all that awkward stuff just fall down because all we want to do in our homes, in our cars, wherever we are, is lift up our hearts to you and praise your name. And so today that's what we're doing. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. I want us to think about, as you think back over this past week, how has he revealed himself to you? Who is this king? We don't just come and just worship whatever. We want to know who he is. So how has he revealed himself to you this week? I've heard some tremendous testimonies about, I'm on the wrong slide, about um, how he's revealed himself to us this week. I've heard people say, 
man, he's just been my place of rest and been a place of peace. He is Yahweh. He is the Prince of Peace. And we can praise him for that. Amen? Amen. Amen. He is a good, good father. And a good, good father provides. I've heard testimonies of how all of a sudden people that were struggling financially, that they, they received an unexpected financial blessing in the mail. Who does that? A good, good father who is our provider. So just in this moment, I just encourage you to lift up your praises. He's sitting right there with you. Wherever you are, he's right there. Let's just speak out our praises to him. Jesus, I praise you for being creator God. Hallelujah. You brought life into this world out of chaos. You speak life into us. You knit us together. You breathe life into us. So I praise your name that you're creator God as we see the flowers beginning to burst forth their color. How you brought that which has been resting over the winter back to life because you are creator God. I praise your name that you are a good, good father. You provide for us. Hallelujah. You take care of us. You care for your kids. You are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's just lift our voices up with how great is our God. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, God. 
We thank you for who you are. You reflect upon this past week. How has he met you? How have you seen him doing a great work in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul? We just want to give him a place of thanks right now. How has he been changing your heart in this time? Maybe he's giving you a greater hunger for him. Maybe he's giving you a greater thirst for his word. That doesn't happen because of us. That happens because he's doing a greater work in us. Aren't you glad he's doing a greater work in you? Maybe he's shown up and you've been blessed beyond what you thought was, would happen. Maybe he's provided you something unexpected. What would you say to him? I just want to give us an opportunity just to say thank you. Maybe he's used you in a mighty powerful way or you were just someone's comfort. They just needed a word of encouragement that he used you. Isn't that amazing how he takes fragile people such as us that are imperfect and yet he uses us in the life of others. I know many of you have reached out to me this week and you've encouraged me and I want you to know that he worked through you to touch me, but he's worked through you to touch others. Jesus is sitting right next to you. What would you say to him? Maybe thank you. An attitude of gratitude eases actually our stress and our, our worry. So let's just take a moment and just say thank you to him. I encourage you to do that amongst yourself, wherever you're at with your families, or even if you're by yourself, just to speak it out. What would you say? Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for how I've seen you provide for me in my life. I'm so humbled that you would even give me the words to speak to someone else. I just think about that encounter that I had a few days ago that was unexpected, that you made those paths cross, that I was able to, to meet with someone I hadn't seen for a while. I'm thankful. Thank you for what you're doing in me, and how you used me. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just encourage you to tell him thank you for the people that you're with. Thank him for the breath of life that you have in your, your lungs. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Well, as we continue to move into our worship, he is the way maker. It doesn't matter what's happening in our lives. It doesn't matter where we've been. He is still working. That's a good thing, isn't it? And even when we can't see it, he's still working. And even when we don't feel it, he's still working. Because he's the way maker. So let's lift our voices. Let's celebrate him for who he is. Because he is the way maker. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For being the way maker. He is 
is who you are. Praise your name. I just, do you believe that? Do you believe that he is the way maker and the promise keeper? I know it's hard. And just like those words say, sometimes we can't see him at work and we wonder, God, where are you? And this is where our step of faith has to come in. And this is where we sing this song. Mike, I'm going to ask you to go through the chorus one more time. This is when we sing it with a strong persuasion. I believe, God, that you are who you say you are. And I believe that even though I can't see you working, even though I don't even feel it, I believe in faith that you are the way maker, the promise keeper, that you are the provider, that you are the king of kings, that you are the Lord of lords. And so I'm going to invite us to sing it one more time. It doesn't matter. The storm's coming against us because he still is king of kings and Lord of lords, and he's still on the throne. So will you sing it out in faith with a strong persuasion? God, I believe you. I'm trusting you today. Let's sing it in faith, a declaration over our lives, over the events of what's going on, that he is the promise keeper and he is the way maker. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Woo. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 we believe it, that is who you are. Oh, yes, you are. We believe you. You're invading the darkness. We praise your name. Hallelujah. This is who you are. We believe you. We trust you. See that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Hallelujah. Jesus, we just praise your name. We thank you that you are the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. Forgive us when we trust in ourselves. Forgive us when we become self-sufficient. But God, continue to take us in these journeys. Continue to press us so that all we have to trust in is you. Keep knocking off our idols. Keep knocking down the things that we've trusted in because you're the only one that we can trust in. So forgive us when we trust in ourselves and we ask that you would help us to walk out our faith, that even though it seems like it's dark, even though it seems like the storms are raging in, we believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're a way maker through the darkness, that you're the light that illuminates the darkness. We praise your name. Hallelujah. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Jesus, we just ask that you would move in us, that we would be able to hear a fresh word from you today. 
What is it that you have for us? We lay down our, pre, pre, uh, our, our previous ideas because all we want is your thoughts to be our thoughts. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Amen. Amen. Oh, he is good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, with that, as we, as we worship, our offering of our tithes and our offerings is a part of our worship. And he invites us to bring a portion. Everything that we have is from him. The only reason that we have life is because he's given us life. The only reason that we have anything is because of him. And that includes our finances. And so he says, I'm going to give you this portion. And now I ask you to return a portion of that back to me, to the house of worship. And that's hard. But it is a step of faith. Right? Not only is giving of our tithes and our offerings a, a place of worship. God, I just praise you because you've, I thank you because of all that you've given to me. But it is a step of obedience and faith that I'm going to return a portion of that back to you to the place where I call my home, where I worship. And so I invite you to mail in your tithes and your offerings to the address. Or you can bring it by the church. There's a box set and by the front door. I check that regularly and bring by your tithes. I appreciate those that have been able to give and give so generously. What a, what a blessing. Um, and we are just trusting him with our finances. Amen. So Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to give of our tithes and our offerings. Lead us to give. Show us how to give. Stretch us even through the gifts of our tithes and our offerings. God, we love you so much. I pray that, that unexpected blessings would just continue to pour in as we are obedient with what you have given to us. We love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to give back to you. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we talked about faith. And again, we're going to continue in that journey. He's really been challenging me with faith in my own life of taking me into places I've never been before. And it's all about allowing God to have his head. <laughs> Last week I had the opportunity, I have some good friends that live north of Topeka that have a horse ranch that they care for pastors and those in ministry. And I had the opportunity last week to spend several days with them and be able to ride. And, and this is Bo. This is the, the guy I rode last week, most of all. And we had a great time. He's, he's a wonderful horse. I want to I wanna talk about riding horses. You can see by this picture that I've given you that the bridle goes around the horse's head and it's attached to the reins, and of course he has the bit that goes across his tongue. This is how you control the horse. If you want him to stop, you pull back on the reins, and he will stop. If you want him to go, you give him his head. You allow him to have his head so he can move and go. And so, oftentimes, when, you, when we have challenging places to ride, you want to give your horse his head. Here I am. Not really, even this picture scares me because I'm a little fearful of heights. But you can see this horse that's going up a very steep hill. You can have two positions on this horse. You can have, you can be riding on this horse and pull back on the reins where he doesn't have the head, where he doesn't have his head. And really that's a place of fear. And a lot of times, I will ride in that place because I'm fearful. In this particular situation, I would be trembling. So you hold on to the, the reins. But in all reality, we ought to give him his head, let go of the reins, and say, Mr. Horse, I trust you. When we give him his head, it allows him to find a place for each of his feet to go up to manage up that hill. He far knows better where to put his feet than I do. So when we give the, him his head, it allows him the opportunity to find his placement for his feet. And he knows that better than we do. 
When I'm in control and I'm fearful because of this, I'm pulling back and really in essence what I'm saying to him is, I know better than you. I don't know better than he does. I'm just living in a place of fear. So there's one of two places that we can live, in a place of fear or a place where we surrender and give him his head. So why do we give the horse his head? It allows him to find his own fit footing, you know, because he's concerned, I'm concerned for my life, toppling all over the edge of the cliff, but so is the horse. So he wants to, to be safely arriving to the top, so he's gonna find the placement for his feet. He knows best, so let go of the reins. This is a scary place to be. It's a scary place to ride, to allow the horse to have his head when you're going through terrain that you're a little bit nervous about. It forces us to say, do I trust this horse or do I not? That's what makes this so hard. And so Bo, this past week, we went out and here we are. <laughs> not really. <laughs> this is really the path that we went. <laughs> Although we did have a few little valleys that we had to go through, and I'm going to talk about that. But this, you have to give the horse his head, right? Because you don't want his, I'd be pulling back, and his head would be going back that way, and that wouldn't be a good place. One of two places to ride, give the horse his head or to pull back in fear. And it's the same way with us in our journey of faith. Remember what faith is. Faith is that that strong persuasion that I'm believing in the one that I cannot see. I'm believing in this God. I can't see him. I can't touch him. But I believe that he is real. And I believe that who he says he is in scripture is true. And so I'm strongly persuaded to trust him. That's what faith is. No matter what comes against us, we have one of two places to live our life at. Pulling back in fear. In essence, what we're saying is, God, I don't trust you. Or allowing God to have his head and saying, God, wherever you go, I'll go. Scary place to be, isn't it? And I think about this journey of faith, and um, I've been thinking a lot about Abraham. And so let's just read. This is Genesis chapter 12. One of the greatest acts of faith I think, in scripture. So the Lord says to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who uh, curses you, I will curse and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I mean, here's what happens, right? God comes to Abe and he says, Abe, I want you to go. And Abe says to God, where do you want me to go? God says, you don't need to know. I'll show you. And Abe says, okay, what about my country, my family, and my father's house? God says, leave him. And then God says, let me have my head. Right? What a tremendous request that God has. God asks Abraham, I want you to go to place. I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. So that's, that's a huge step of faith. Abraham either says, God, I'm going to go, or he pulls back on the reins and says, no. But we also see that Abraham begins to struggle. He's like, what about my family? What about my country that I believe in? What about my father's house that provides me protection? What about them? And God says, I want you to leave. Will you give me my head and let me take you on a journey that I have for you? Will you let me take you to something better than what you could ever imagine? Or will you pull back on the reins and not go? And we call this faith because we have to come to the point where we believe that God is who he says he is. We have to come to the point and believe that where God wants to take us, where he's asking us to go is the best place for us. 
that it's better than what we can imagine and what we can uh, think up. It's, it, so here's the question. Is it enough to say, I believe that there is a God? Is it really enough to say, well, I go to church? Is it enough to say in our faith that I do all the good Christian things I'm supposed to do? I'm not certain that scripture says that it is enough. And I'm not talking about striving for our salvation. But what I am talking about is if we believe that Jesus died on the cross for us, if we believe that Jesus went into the depths of hell and laid out his blood to, to pay the debt that is ours, this ought to change us. If we believe that he is our savior, is it enough for us just to come to church to get what it is that we want and to leave and to, for our lives never to be the same? Jesus says, if you love me, you will be obedient to me. Jesus says, if you love me, you will get on this horse and you will let me have my head and let me take you to where it is that I want you to go. You're going to let me challenge you in your life to ask you to be obedient to me in a way you've never been. That's what he asks for us. In fact, in James chapter 2, verse 14, and, and you ought to spend some time in James chapter 2, he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Now, he's not talking about earning your salvation by works, but he's saying, if you have faith, if you believe that this Jesus is who he says he is, and you've asked him to be king of your life, what good is that if you don't live that out? It's like, it's like when the rubber hits the road. Our works is when we begin to live out that faith. You might be on your horse and encounter a big storm. You can pull back on the reins and go around that storm, or you can let God have his head and say, okay, I don't know how you're going to get me through this storm, but I believe you're going to get me through this storm. That's putting works with your faith. That's living out your faith. That's giving him his head. And this is exactly what... God is asking Abraham to do. He says, I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your father's house. And I want you to go to a land that I'm not even going to tell you. Will you go? That's getting on the horse and saying, God, you take me to where it is that you need me to go. And really, what, what are his country, his family, and his father's house. These are things that Abraham could have easily trusted in. He was very loyal to his country, but his country was a country that worshipped all kinds of gods, all kinds of idols. Much like sometimes our lives, where we can worship many different things to find stability, to find hope, to find happiness that we devote our time to. And so what, Ab what God was doing is he was asking him to move out of this land, even out of his family, even out of his father's house, to come completely out of that area where he was protected and provided for, to come out into a place where it's just him and God and he's completely exposed. God was asking him to come to a place where all he had was God to rely upon. That's faith. And the obedience of him deciding to say, I'll go, is Abraham's works. It's the rubber hitting the road. It's Abraham saying, yes, I believe that you're God. Yes, I believe that you will provide for me. Yes, I believe that so much I'll leave everything else that I have trusted in behind. And I'll go where you ask me to go. That's, it's not an easy, easy place to be, is it? Can we have faith? Can we believe that there is a God? Can we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and not be obedient and not have the works? Well, if you continue to read in John, James chapter 2, he says, even Satan believes that there's a God. That doesn't mean that he is a follower of Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll be obedient. You'll get on the horse and you'll let me lead you through it. That's a difficult place to be. But wow, it's an amazing place. 
Oftentimes we don't mind sitting on the horse and saying, hey, I believe that there's a God, and we don't mind pulling back on the reins, but God is asking us to let go of those reins and to trust him. And usually what gets in the way is our control, our fear. And in, in reality, what we're saying is, God, I trust myself. I trust my own wisdom over your wisdom. I trust myself to provide for me. Now, we'll ask God to bless it, but that's not the same. It's getting on the horse and saying, God, I don't know how, but I know you're going to lead me through this. I don't know how, God, you're asking me to go to another land to be obedient to you in a way I've never been obedient to you, and I don't know how to do it. I don't know if I'm equipped to it, but I believe that you're going you're gonna to lead me to it. You're going to lead me through it. There's always a reason for us not to give God his head and allow him to lead us. We might find it too hard, and yes, it is hard, but nowhere in the scripture does Jesus say, says, says to us, if you, know, if you know me as your Lord and Savior, your life is going to be easier. Faith is hard. It requires a lot of trust, a lot of persuasion to say, I don't know, but I trust you. It's, it would be easy for us to, um, to say, God, I love all these idols. If you love me, you'll let me keep them. He doesn't work that way. He says, there's only one God and it's him. And so we have to lay down those idols and to move out of that land that pulls us back into trusting in other things. Then there's that flesh, right? That ugly flesh that rises up within us that says, I want, I, I, I don't want to follow you I, on this. I want to do what it is that I want to do because this is my life. That's not faith either, but it's easy to say that, isn't it? And that's pulling back on those reins. And we remember in Hebrews eleven six, the one way to please God is by living out our faith. The one reason, the, the one way to please God is to get on that horse and to say, take me away, I turn away from this country, I turn away from my family, I turn away from my father's house to follow after you, no matter the cost. So what made Abraham's faith so pleasing? Even though it cost him a lot, he went. He believed that God would provide for him he believed that God would give him what he needs. And in fact, if you continue to follow the story of Abraham, now he, may, he had some blunders, and his blunders came because he all of a sudden pulled back on the reins. But through the story of Abraham, there were some tremendous acts of faith. Tremendous times when he was on the horse and God was leading him through a valley that he didn't know how to go through, but he believed that God would deliver him. And God certainly did. He was simply obedient. That is pleasing to God. And look, we often want God to bless us. But God doesn't just bless us. He asks us to be obedient to him. He asks us to get on the horse and to give him the head and say, wherever you lead, I'll go. That pleases him. And when we do that, he's able to bless us. When we give back to him as he asks us to do, that's when he can bless us. So even in this passage in verses two and three, we see five, six promises of how God is going to bless Abraham. Abraham, if you go to the land where I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna bless you. Abraham, if you leave your country, if you leave your family, if you leave your father's house, I'm gonna bless you. And look at how he's gonna bless. He says, Abraham, you're gonna be a great nation. And Abraham becomes a great nation, not only of the Jewish people, but of the Gentiles. He's a man with a, a father of many people. God says, you will abound, you and your family will abound in great fruitfulness by your obedience, by your faithfulness. He says, Abraham, your name is going to be great. His name is great just by the fact that he's in scripture so many times in Genesis and Romans, Hebrews, he's talked about. His name is great and his name was great among the land. He says, you're going to be a blessing. Your life will bless others. And then he says, and those who curse you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna curse, I'm gonna take care of. But those who bless you, I'm gonna bless them as well. Because of Abraham's willingness to get on the horse and to go to a land that he didn't know, and because of Abraham's willingness to let go of his things that were most important to him, country, 
family in his father's house, God was able to bless him. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. But he asks us to live that out in faith, to get on the horse and to allow him to have, to have his head and to go wherever he needs to go and wherever he wants us to go. God won't bless us if we refuse to be obedient. But when we live out this faith, we are blessed. When we say, okay, God, you can have your head. You, wherever you go, I'll go. That's actually when we find the greatest peace. We want God to bless us with peace. But the greatest peace comes when we are obedient to him. Look what Isaiah 26, 3 says. Those of steadfast mind, and steadfast mind, steadfast means those that are faithful. Those that are living out this faith. Now Isaiah is talking to God. He says, those of steadfast faith, those that are living out their faith, you keep in peace. And then he goes on, in peace, because why? Because they trust you. We may be going over the cliff on our horse, but there's no greater peace than knowing that God is that horse and he's leading us through that valley. It seems strange, doesn't it? And very difficult, but that is the truth. That's what his word says. Will we believe him? Will we trust him? We have a tendency to get on the horse and say, oh, I don't trust God. I don't know. How can I be in peace when I'm going down this hill into this valley? I'm going to pull back. We don't even know if we can experience God's peace because we're pulling back and saying, God, I don't want to go. And so here's Bo. And we had a, a good ride on many flat trails, not like the picture I showed earlier. But even within these trails, there were a few valleys that were deep that he ended up having to jump. And so the first one we came to was rather steep. And I'm like, uh-oh. And I knew I had one of two places to ride. I'm either going to keep his head and say, I know better than you, Bo. Or I was just going to let him say, Bo, you know best. And so I let him have his head. Now I hung on to the saddle horn and I was kind of scrunched down and I was hanging on, but he had his head believing and I was believing that he was going to get through. And sure enough, all four feet came off the ground and he jumped over this ravine over to the other side and then I pulled back. <laughs> and I was hanging on, but it was amazing. It was so much fun. So we kept riding and then we came to another one and I'm like, well... I, get, I made it through that last one. I think I can do this. Still hung on to the saddle horn, gave him his head, but probably didn't hang on as tight as I had the first time, certainly not in fear. And you know what we did? We jumped it. And I kind of pulled back after we got to the other side, but man, I'm, this is fun. This is really cool to see this horse do what he's doing and what he's intended to do. And then we came to a third one. And by this time, I was really confident truly was. And I was having so much fun because I was trusting him. And I knew that he cared about getting over to the other side safely just as much as I did. And so we came to this last steep ravine and I'm like, go ahead, Bo. I had the saddle horn and I hung on, but he jumped it. And when he hit the other side, instead of me pulling back, I'm like, you just keep on going. And we just kept going up the hill. It was so much fun. It was just, it was such a blessing to be a part of that. This is the journey that God has for us. And he asks us, you know what? Let me have my head. Let me take you on my best. There's always something that's causing us to pull back on the reins and say, no, I don't want to go. There's always a country, family, or father's house in our life that keeps us from allowing him to take us to his best. So Jesus may be speaking to you today. What's he asking you to turn from? It might be a sin. It might be an addiction. It might be fear of finances. It might be an idol. It might be those things that are most precious to you that you say, I've got to have this in order to feel content. He's asking you today, Will you let go of those things? Will you let me move you out of that land so all you have is me? Even our fears become that country that we trust in. I know best. I'm fearful. I know best. 
maybe he's asking you to leave that today. Will you get on the horse and say, you know what, God, I don't, I, I give you my sin, I give you my finances, I give you my temptations, my idols, those things that are most dear, I'll give you my fears, all I want to do is follow after and to go where it is that you go. Because you know what? His best is far better than what we can come up with. He's got great things planned for you. He wants you to experience the fullness of God. He wants you to look back as you've crossed the first ravine and say, wow, I can do this. And then you get to the second ravine and you're a lot more confident than you were on the first one. And then you get to the third one and you're like, let's go. And that's what he does. He takes these difficult times. Every time he asks us to move away from our country, our family, our father's house, he takes us down a steeper journey to grow our faith. If we never live that out, if we never work it, or if we never put rubber to the road, we'll never grow in our faith. What's he asking you to let go of today? What would you say to him? It's as easy as saying, Jesus, forgive me for hanging on to these things. Jesus, I want to move away from them. Help me to do that. If it's sin, confess it to him. Ask him for forgiveness and ask him to fill you with more of his spirit to move you away from that sin. Ask him to fill you with the fullness of him. Now, the reality of it is, is when you turn away from those things and getting on the horse, these things will kind of come back and tempt you and you say, you know what, I've let that go. I'm going to keep going wherever he's taking me. I think about these times where, um, as we're ending this time apart, many of our lives have slowed down. And I've heard many of you say, you know what, I found it. This has been nice. I've been able to spend more time with God. I've been able to spend more time with my family. I really don't want things to go back the way they were. It's easy for the things to come back that we used to worship to come into our lives and to consume us. At some point, we have to make the decision that, God, I trust you for everything, whether it's finances, whether it's making things work if I make him a priority, spending more time with him, trusting him that, as I spend more time with him and with my family, that all the other things that I have to get done, they'll get done. It's trusting him, living out in faith. How will you respond? I don't want us to go back. I, I don't think that we can go back to the way it used to be. I think God is calling us as his followers, as his church, to leave our country, to leave our families, to leave our father's house to live in a faith that we've never lived before. I believe he's calling us to greater things than we've ever been. And the only way that we'll experience them is if we're willing to allow God to have his head and to take us where he wants us to go. How will you respond? Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you invite us to go on this journey of life, this ride of life with you. Forgive us when we pull back on the reins. Forgive us when we question you. Forgive us when we doubt you. Forgive us when we step into the driver's seat. Today we want to surrender that. And God, we ask that whatever it is that's in our life that keeps pulling us back to pull back on the reins, God, show us and convict us that we will surrender that to you to get on that horse and to ride it wherever you take us. That's what we want to do. Grow our faith. Give us the courage to step out and to live it out, even though it doesn't make sense. We praise your name. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives and for our lives and through our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He's so good. Well, I, I do want to also make a comment. Check out Maryville Church of the Nazarene Facebook page. There was an announcement that was put on a couple of days ago. May 7th is coming up, and that is the National Day of Prayer. And Ina and myself, we're calling the church and whoever will join us to a day of prayer. 
So I encourage you, you can respond to this. If you have my number, you can text me or text Ina and say, you know what, I want to pray for an hour. And say, this is the hour that I can pray. We're going from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. On, on May 7th. Let's step out in faith and believe that when we cry out for our, our church, for our country, our president, even for our lives, for those that are lost, that God hears our prayers and that mountains can be moved. So I encourage you, join us on May 7th for a day of prayer. Well, with that, let's say together the Apostles' Creed as our benediction. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Those are some good words, right? This is our faith of what we believe. And may it preserve you blameless this week. May it draw you into his presence. Know that you are loved. You are precious to him. And he's got great things planned for you. Get on the horse and say, God, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Go in his peace and know that you are loved. God bless you and amen.